Hallo und herzlich willkommen. Äh, einen wunderschönen guten Abend äh, Ihnen allen hier im Körperforum. Ähm, mein Name ist Julia André. Ich gehöre hier zum Haus und leite bei uns äh, den Bereich Bildung und freue mich sehr, hier, Sie alle heute Abend hier begrüßen zu dürfen zu unserer Veranstaltung mit dem Titel Making the Future. Ähm, warum dieser Titel und warum auf Englisch? Also auf Englisch nicht nur, weil immer alles gleich viel besser und moderner und äh, innovativer klingt, sondern tatsächlich, weil es eine Veranstaltung auf Englisch ist heute mit einem englischsprachigen Gast. Ähm, aber wir haben natürlich für eine äh, Simultanübersetzung äh, gesorgt. Das heißt, falls Sie die gerne hätten, aber noch kein Headset, noch keine Kopfhörer haben, ist das jetzt die letzte Gelegenheit, sich das zu besorgen. Ähm, wir haben den Titel aber natürlich auch mit äh, einem, einem ganz bestimmten Hintersinn gewählt. Making the Future, da steckt ja eine ziemlich starke These drin, nämlich die These, dass wir unsere Zukunft tatsächlich selber machen, dass wir sie gestalten äh, und damit entscheiden äh, darüber als Gesellschaft, als Individuen, wie wir in Zukunft leben wollen. Und äh, ich würde mal behaupten, das ist nicht ganz selbstverständlich heutzutage. Es gibt, glaube ich, nicht wenige Menschen, die anfangen daran zu zweifeln. Ähm, in Zeiten von fortschreitender Digitalisierung, die ja wirklich rasant alle Lebensbereiche verändert und natürlich vor allen Dingen auch ähm, im Zuge der Entwicklung im Bereich der KI, also der künstlichen Intelligenz, kann man sich ja schon fragen, ob wir eigentlich noch diejenigen sind, äh, die bestimmen, wie wir in Zukunft leben werden. Das sind Fragen, mit denen wir uns bei der Körperstiftung sehr intensiv befassen wollen in nächster Zeit. Und dazu haben wir uns einen neuen Themenschwerpunkt gesetzt, den wir unter die Überschrift, unter die programmatische Überschrift Technik braucht Gesellschaft gestellt haben. Hintergrund und Ausgangspunkt war unter anderem das Technikradar. Das ist eine große bundesweite repräsentative Befragung, eine Studie, die wir im letzten Jahr zum ersten Mal veröffentlicht haben die mal ganz grob gesagt erfasst, wie die Deutschen über Technik denken. Und das hat in der Tat ein paar ganz interessante und zum Teil auch widersprüchliche Befunde hervorgebracht. Ich will nur mal drei herausgreifen. Das erste ist, dass Menschen tatsächlich Technologie, neue Technologien als eine Art Naturgewalt wahrnehmen. Ähm, ach, äh, ich glaube, es sind, na, ich gucke nochmal nach, 89 Prozent, also wirklich ein, eine überwiegende Mehrheit sagt, das können wir eigentlich gar nicht so richtig beeinflussen, das kommt über uns. Äh, gleichzeitig wünschen sich viele Menschen, dass Technik eingehegt wird gesellschaftlich. Drei Viertel geben an, dass ihnen bei der Bewertung von Technik wichtig ist, dass sie zum Gemeinwohl beiträgt und mit gesellschaftlichen Werten in Einklang steht. Ähm, wiederum ein Viertel sagt allerdings nur, ähm, dass Technik tatsächlich, äh, so wie wir sie jetzt erleben, äh, mehr Probleme löst, als sie schafft. Also ich glaube, man kann festhalten an dieser Stelle äh, Technik-Skepsis äh, in Deutschland äh, und umso mehr freue ich mich, dass wir heute äh, mit Stefania Druger einen Gast bei uns haben, der, glaube ich, äh, einen etwas anderen Blick auf Technologie hat, äh, vor allen Dingen die Potenziale sieht und äh, seit vielen Jahren äh, sich mit der Frage befasst in ihrer wissenschaftlichen Forschung, aber auch mit vielen wirklich großartigen Projekten weltweit, äh, wie, sie, wie digitale Technologien, insbesondere auch äh, Fragen rund um künstliche Intelligenz für Menschen zugänglich gemacht werden können und wie sie auch wirklich selber gestalten können und teilhaben können. Ähm Sie ist von weit weg zu uns gekommen. Sie ist eigentlich in den USA, ist Research Associate am MIT Media Lab. Das ist wirklich eine der führenden Forschungsinstitutionen zum Thema gesellschaftlicher Wandel und Zukunftstechnologien und hat, wie ich schon erwähnt habe, aber auch viele, viele wirklich praktische Projekte weltweit gestartet. Unter anderem, davon wird sie sicherlich auch gleich erzählen, die Plattform Cognimates, die äh, ja, eine Möglichkeit bietet für Eltern mit ihren Kindern tatsächlich mit, mit künstlicher Intelligenz ähm, zu experimentieren, selber zu programmieren und sich so mit diesem sehr, sehr komplexen Feld vertraut zu machen. Ähm, auch das ganze große Thema Maker Education liegt ihr wirklich am Herzen. Da hat sie ähm, unter in Afrika äh, Projekte gestartet. Sie ist also, kann man sagen, eine Pionierin, 
äh, was Zukunftsgestaltung mit digitalen Technologien angeht. Und äh, ich freue mich sehr, dass sie ein Stück Zukunft uns hier mit ins Coverforum äh, gebracht hat. Very welcome, Stefania. We are very happy to have you here. Welcome in Hamburg. Sie wird uns gleich in einem kurzen Vortrag mit auf diese Reise nehmen und äh, sicherlich eine Menge erzählen von dem, was sie macht und wozu sie forscht. Ähm, ganz herzlich begrüßen möchte ich auch Joran Musmeerholz, ähm, der im Anschluss mit Stefania sprechen wird und die Themen im Gespräch noch mal vertiefen wird. Er, er ist äh, Medienpädagoge, ähm, hat eine Agentur hier in Hamburg, Joran und Konsorten und ist selber auch viel unterwegs als Autor, als Sprecher, ähm, als Moderator, aber eben auch rund um die Themen von, von Bildung und Digitalisierung, die ja heute auch hier äh, Thema sein werden. Er wird uns auch gleich verraten, äh, wie Sie alle sich heute äh, beteiligen können. Das äh, machen wir natürlich heute ähm, digital. Ich habe gesehen mit großer Freude, also Handypflicht heute Abend, ja, dass äh, viele von Ihnen Ihre Smartphones schon gezückt haben, die werden Sie auch brauchen. Ähm, gleichzeitig werden wir im Anschluss aber natürlich wieder auch ganz analog äh, die Möglichkeit haben, weiter uns auszutauschen und zu diskutieren. Sie sind wie immer herzlich eingeladen, am Anschluss noch an ein Glas Wein oder Wasser hier im Coverforum. Jetzt übergebe ich an Joran, du wirst uns einweisen und dann freue ich mich auf einen tollen Abend mit Stefania Druger und dir. Danke. Moin. Die erste Veranstaltung seit sehr langem, zu der ich zu Fuß kommen konnte. Ähm, Sie brauchen Ihr Handy. Also der Handy ist ja eine verniedliche Bezeichnung für diese sehr mächtigen Computer. Sie brauchen ein Smartphone, muss das also genauer heißen. Und ähm, da sehen Sie dann gleich auf diesem Bildschirm oben so etwas Ähnliches, wie Sie hier drauf sehen. Sie brauchen keine extra Anwendung oder sowas. Es reicht ein handelsüblicher Browser. Es muss auch nicht unbedingt ein Smartphone sein. Wenn Sie irgendwas Größeres haben, was einen Browser bedienen kann, funktioniert das auch. Und da müssen Sie eine Adresse eingeben. Und selbst wenn Sie jetzt sagen, Sie wollen sich jetzt noch nicht beteiligen, falls Sie irgendwann am Laufe des Abends dann doch sagen, jetzt möchten Sie eine Frage stellen, sollten Sie die Adresse kennen. Und die steht da oben unter dem ersten orangen Punkt. Oh, es geht schon los. Ähm, bevor die Erklärung auch nur zu Ende ist. Unter der Adresse, die da oben steht, polev.com und dann der Querstrich und dahinter heißt es Körber Edu, aber geschrieben ist es Querber Edu. Das ist die einzige Adresse, die Sie dafür brauchen. Und dann sehen Sie ein Feld, wo Sie Fragen eingeben können. Und wir machen das jetzt mit einer ganz einfachen Frage vorab, weil egal, ob man das mit 13-Jährigen, mit 30-Jährigen oder mit etwas älteren Menschen macht, alle müssen zuerst das einmal ausprobieren. Ähm, da muss man offensichtlich einmal durch, dass man da irgendwas gemacht hat, was vielleicht da nicht ganz so zum Thema passt. Ähm, insofern können Sie da jetzt reinschreiben, was Sie mögen. Das Ganze funktioniert relativ einfach. Man hat drei Schritte. Man kann da eine Frage reinschreiben und absenden. Man kann sehen, was andere geschrieben haben. Das steht dann bei Ihnen unten drunter. Und man kann da jeweils sagen, ob man diese Frage für besonders geeignet oder nicht geeignet hält. Und die Fragen, die am meisten Bewertungen mit sehr geeignet bekommen, die werden wir dann nachher einfach hier vorne auf dem Podium diskutieren. Damit ist mein Job der Erste, der zumindest zur Hälfte von einem Algorithmus übernommen wird, weil ich dann nur Fragen vorlesen muss. Wenn da totaler Quatsch steht, können Sie einfach sagen, es gefällt Ihnen nicht und verschwindet es so nach unten. Wenn Sie sagen, das passiert, passt Ihnen gar nicht oder Sie haben einfach nicht so ein Gerät dabei, gibt es immer noch einen Umweg. Da hinten steht nämlich Katharina hier vom Haus. Ähm, Sie müssen mal da hingucken. Katharina hat nämlich Zettel und Stift. Und davon kann sie Fragen ablesen, die Sie ihr aufschreiben. Und die tippt Sie dann ein. Also es gibt nicht einen ähm, digitalen Zwang. Wir können das auch so vermittelt machen. So, jetzt bin ich der Einzige im Raum, der das nicht sehen kann, was da bisher steht. Okay, also Sie sind schon sehr aktiv. Ähm, die Idee nachher ist tatsächlich, dass Sie eine Frage reinschreiben und ähm, mal sehen, manchmal hat das auch so Eigendynamik. Also wenn Sie anfangen, die Fragen von anderen darin zu beantworten, ähm, wird es schnell unübersichtlich, aber das liegt in Ihrer Hand. Ich sage einmal für ähm, Stefania Druga, die ja zu Gast hier ist, in Deutschland sagt man sehr gerne folgenden Satz, gerade im Bildungsbereich, das Digitale darf ja nicht nur ein Selbstzweck sein. 
Also sowas wie ein ähm, Schnickschnack, um jetzt Fragen zu machen, die man noch genauso gut hier im Raum stellen könnte oder auf Papier. Und jetzt würde man wahrscheinlich diese Aussage schon unterschreiben. Das darf nicht nur ein Selbstzweck sein, aber ich finde, es darf auch ein Selbstzweck sein, weil wie soll es denn sonst äh, gehen, dass wir lernen, wie man damit umgeht? Das Schwierige an diesem Zeug, an diesem Schnickschnack, ist ja nicht, dass wir lernen, auf welches Feld wir da drücken müssen, sondern das Schwierige ist, wie wir unsere Aufmerksamkeit aufteilen zwischen, dass da irgendwas passiert und hier gleich irgendwas passiert und auf ihrem Gerät vielleicht auch sonst noch irgendwas passiert. Und das ist ja das, was man nicht in einem 60-Minuten-Kurs lernen kann, sondern durch Üben. Insofern finde ich tatsächlich, Technik darf häufig auch, auch Selbstzweck sein. So, die populärste Frage ist ganz oben. Wann geht es los? Die werde ich gleich beantworten. Die anderen Fragen kann ich nicht beantworten. Das ist auch das Einzige, was ich kann. Haben Sie Fragen noch zu diesem Vorgehen? Weil das verschwindet gleich wieder. Auf Ihrem Gerät sehen Sie dann gleich die Möglichkeit, tatsächlich die Frage nachher für die Diskussion zu stellen. Sie können das also auch schon während des Vortrags machen. Sie können sich auch sagen, ich warte mal, bis der Vortrag zu Ende ist, weil ich kann das nicht so gut mit Aufmerksamkeit aufteilen. Ich höre erst mal zu, bringe danach meine Frage rein, wie Sie das wollen. Aber Fragen stellen, wie das Ganze funktioniert, können Sie während des Vortrags nicht. Deswegen, das wäre jetzt eine gute Gelegenheit. Passen Sie auf, mögen Sie mit dem Herrn den Platz tauschen, dann sitzen Sie neben mir und ich zeige Ihnen das gleich. Hat jemand die gleiche Frage? Ich vermittle gerne noch mehr Partner. Man, ja, man kann dadurch auch Plätze in der ersten Reihe noch bekommen. Gut, dann räume ich jetzt ähm, die Bühne und beantworte die Frage 1, wann geht es los mit in 45 Sekunden, aber so lange müssten Sie so kräftig, wie Sie können, klatschen für die Person, die nicht nur den weitesten Weg hatte, sondern auch diejenige ist, die heute Abend im Mittelpunkt stehen soll. Ich freue mich sehr. Ich bin sehr, sehr gespannt auf den Vortrag und die anschließende Diskussion mit Stefania Druga. Guten Abend, <lacht> mein Name ist Stefania Druge. Ähm, verstehen Deutsch ein bisschen, <lacht> aber sprechen zu Arbeit ist äh, difficult. Äh, ja, dies. <lacht> so I will speak to English. I'm very happy to be here with you tonight. Um, thank you very much uh, to the Kerber Foundation for the, the invitation. And um, I just wanted to see before I start talking, because I normally talk very fast, uh, I just wanted to see how many people in the room speak English. Okay. Perfect, you make my life so much easier now. Um, great, so in that case, if at any point I go too fast, just raise your hand so I know like, okay, Stefania, slow down. Because I want to share a lot of stories with you tonight. Actually, Katarina gave me a very difficult task. She was, you cannot talk only about your research at Media Lab, you also have to talk about what you've done before. So basically, I tried to summarize eight years of research in a 30 minutes presentation. We'll see how that goes. <laughs> um, Yeah, so tonight we're going to talk about making the future and what does that mean? Who do we make the future with? And why am I interested in this? Um, so I, I come from a very, very small town, actually. I am, a, although I live in US now, I'm Romanian, I'm very much European. Uh, and I grew up in this small town in Transylvania, in the middle of the mountains. So for me, um, I got exposed to technology later in life. I was already 19 and I always thought like, oh my God, what would I have done if I learned these skills when I was like six years old or when I was much younger? Um, so when I realized that, I created this organization called Hackidemia and basically, The, the goal of this organization and the vision is that we believe that kids should learn by creating, by inventing, and that technologies and science and all the things that we have in our society should not only be consumed, but they should also be created by, by young people. So when I started this, like this was my dream. It was to enable kids to become creator of technologies and not only consumers. Um, and I wanted them to learn technology in a project-based 
way, like integrating it with art, integrating it with local culture, traditions, in a much more grounded way. So what I loved about my work is that it allowed me to actually work with kids like, like uh, this little girl. This is actually a picture from Berlin. And it was one of the first Hackademia uh, workshops we've done. How old do you think this girl is? Can I have a guess? Nine, six, that's a wide range. I like it. We're going to use the tool and see. <laughs> uh, she's actually six. And can you, can you see what she's doing in the picture? Yeah, she's soldering. So she's like basically gluing electronic components. She's actually building a universal remote control because we had this workshop where we wanted to create a remote control that can turn off any TV. Um, and I just thought it would be so beautiful if the kids could have this like magic superpower, go into a room and turn off all the TVs so people start, stop watching TV and start doing more interesting things. But, you know, we started, yeah, yeah. We started from... Um, from like all the components that come into play when we build a remote control. Uh, yeah, do we, do we have translation here? Is everything okay? It's too loud. Oh, it's too loud. No, no, no. I can whisper. No, no. <laughs> oh, the device is too loud. Yeah, so the volume is on the side. I had the same issue with mine. So there's like a slider on the side, so we can change the, yep. So basically this little girl at six, I told her, you can build a, a universal remote control. And she said, no. And I said, yes. And I start showing her how to use a soldering iron and what the components are and what is inside the remote control. How does it work? And she's six, right? So this girl who is six spent three hours focusing and soldering and building her universal remote control, right? In a normal school, we would not allow a six-year-old girl to solder because we would say it's too dangerous, it's not safe. And the reason we do that is because most of the people who are trying to change education system are a product of that system, where we were told that you can only learn certain things at a certain age, where you are told that certain things are dangerous and certain things are not. But actually, the way we learn is much less structured like that. Like, look at how we learn at home, or when we play, or when we grow up, like the first years of life, right? If you touch the, the stove once and you get burned, you know, and you're not going to touch it again. Uh, <laughs> so in many ways, like, we don't need to dumb down like information and what we teach our kids. We should actually allow them to be part of complex projects and decisions and be part of the conversation. And how do we know that a six years old cannot do this or understand this if we don't give them the chance to try it, right? So what was amazing after this is that initially her parents were super scared. So they were looking at me, they were looking at the soldering iron, they were like, I hope you know what you're doing, do you have insurance? <laughs> like, you know, they were like super, super scared. And two days later, they actually called me, where Stefania, what can, where can we buy a soldering iron? Because like, our daughter wants to keep on doing this. Like, I couldn't stop her. I wanted to like, do you want to take a break, drink some water? No, she was like, I have this resistor. I know what the resistor is now. I'm going to, you know, she loved it. And this is what I do. Like, this is why I created Hackademia. This is what makes me get up in the morning. And this is really, really like, after working with kids, all around the world for eight years old, every single time I do a workshop, I learn something. And every single time, they amaze me. So a big part of what I'm going to tell you today, it's about how we can listen to kids more and how much we can learn from them and with them. So with Hackademia, we had lots of different activities. The idea was to have mobile learning, like we had 3D printers that we could take around. Uh, we also allowed kids to create like their own, like microscopes by uh, hacking existing cheap webcams. Um, and then if they had a microscope, this was actually in Budapest, they start taking samples of the water in town or the water they're drinking and see what's inside. Um, and you're going to ask me, OK, how can you make a microscope from a webcam? You just flip the lens. And uh, it works. Um, and then we had a lot of, like, this was actually the first 
maker fair I did in uh, Lagos in Nigeria. Oh, I should mention that this was 2012, right? So it's a while back. Uh, and at the time, you know, I was doing all these workshops and actually involving parents as well because the best thing that I can do is to actually enable families to continue this at home. The idea is not that kids come to our workshops or just do this in school. As you will come to see in my talk, parents play a huge role. So we actually want to help families to integrate more this kind of like learning together and playing together at home as well. And yeah, these were like some examples of projects. We documented them and made videos and shared them. Anything from a tongue game, <laughs> don't ask me how that works, it's very funny, to uh, you know, like robots and sensors, but also more artistic things like creating conductive paint with vitamin C. Um, and you will, you will ask me, like, how do you think of all these things? And the, the answer is I didn't. Like, I actually learned with the kids and the mentors and the local teams. Like, you know, they would, like, see, oh, if we actually draw with, like, charcoal, with, like, pencil, that's conductive. How can we make other conductive things? Oh, if we make the paper wet, that's conductive too, so we can make an instrument with it. So all of these ideas come by doing, by tinkering, by using our hands, by playing together, um, and... One second. And yeah, and we learn a lot. Basically, when you allow for creative learning to happen, where the we call the adults in the room mentors, they're not teachers, they're mentors. So when you know your older brother or sister, or like a volunteer student, or your parent, or they're all like playing together, learning together, tinkering, it allows for much more magic and creativity to, to come to, to happen. So We've done this around the world. This is an example of a poster that was done by local organizers in Bucharest. Uh, we basically had this in more than 15 countries and trained a lot of local men mentors and uh, created a kit so people can also get like this box with different um, tools and also instructions of projects. And then, um, and yeah, I should say that basically when I started this, like. It's interesting to share with you and even for myself to go back in the slides and put images from 2012 and to realize like, oh my God, you know, in 2012 when I was talking about teaching coding to kids, everyone thought I'm crazy. It's like, coding is so complicated. Why should we teach it to kids? It's like, have you thought about what you're saying? And now finally, you know, like we have Code for Germany, Code for Romania. We're talking a lot about STEM education. I'm sure you heard about it. Um, so it took us a while to get here. And what I'm going to advocate for is like, let's not do the same with machine learning and AI because that's here now. It's already in the home. So we should, we should also have AI literacy, not only coding literacy. And the other important part of this conversation is like, how do we design for inclusion? We do not want only people with opportunities to have access to this type of learning, this type of experiences. Because actually the best ideas and the best solutions and the best projects come from people who have strong needs, right? So if you have like a big problem, you're not gonna create an app that will solve the world, and it's just a social media sharing button. Uh, you will actually create a, a solution that is really meaningful for your community. And this is what I did in the next project I will share. So as I was running Hackademia Workshop, I was part of this conference called Republica. I'm sure you heard about it. Uh, it's in uh, Berlin. And I got to meet these wonderful people. So these people are coming from all around Africa. They're founders of local like fab labs, makerspaces, makerspaces innovation hub, hubs. So they all come to Berlin. And I did a workshop where I was teaching them how to solder, build things, and program. And they invited me. They were like, Stefania, you have to come to Kenya. We'll do a workshop. And you have to come to Tanzania. And I was like, I'm not going to come there to do the workshop and leave. Like, if I come, I want to train you. And you will do the workshop. And then you continue to do it. And we start talking about it. How can we make it like something local that people can continue after I'm gone? And we created this project called AfriMakers. Um, and basically, the idea was to encourage makers in Africa. And why is that? Like, actually, there is a very long tradition. This is from Accra of hands-on crafting repair that I uh, I know exists, like in all the countries that I work 
in and I wanted to, you know, meet these people who build their own. This is actually someone's fridge. They build it. Um, this, this is one of the local inventors uh, in um, Kenya. He built his own welding station, right? And he even had his improvised welding gas, which for me was like, whoa. Um, so, so the idea with AfriMakers was that as an opposite, as a counterbalance to this neo-colonialist, like let's help people that are poor, we wanted to create something very different, which was let's learn from people who have like challenges, um, and not go there and be, we are here to help, but actually allow them to develop their own skills and help themselves. And um, basically the project was crowdfunded on Indiegogo, and that's how we got the money to do it. I was the only foreigner, uh, and I wasn't actually directly involved. I was more of a mentor. So the model was to train local mentors, give them toolkits, um, bring the spark of like you can invent things, you can fix things, and then allow them to like train other people and and go on. So we gave them maker boxes, and then we start doing the mentor training. And these were like a couple of the countries we went to. So basically, it started in Egypt. I trained the first team in Egypt, and then the most proactive mentors from Egypt would go to Kenya and train, these are actually mentors from Kenya training the people in Tanzania, and then the people from Tanzania would go to Rwanda and so on. And that was very important because actually we have a lot of people from abroad going to Africa, but I'm sure you heard that the boundary, the, the frontiers in Africa are artificial, like they were drawn on a map. So people in Kenya and Tanzania have much more in common than we think. So allowing them to actually work together and be like, oh, you have a problem with access to electricity. Oh, you have that problem too. How should we go about it? How can we solve it? Um, so that was like what this project was trying to do. And I brought the element like, oh, you build your own you know, solar panel. Now you're going to go and teach it to kids. And they're like, you want us to teach it to kids? Again, you know, it's like, it's too complicated. And I'm like, okay, you go and talk to them and then you'll tell me. And they went to schools and they did each of these teams did like different things, right? Like they were uh, creating like their own filters for polluted air or water, or I don't know, they also had like more fun projects like games, um, like having like a video game where you can count like traffic in the city, all sorts of things. And then they would like go and teach it in schools and Basically, this was one of the workshops in schools. And after they did the first workshop in school, the kids had much better questions and ideas. It's like, oh, why did you use this sensor and not this sensor? Or why did you use this material and not this material? And then the students realized, like, oh my god, these kids actually are learning faster than we are. So it makes sense to go to schools. And then the other thing that they realized is, like, how much hunger for knowledge there is, right? Because one thing that I can tell you coming from a very small village in the middle of nowhere in Romania is that I always thought like, oh, if you are working very hard, you're going to do things. If you're perseverant, you're always going to succeed. I had that bias because, you know, I'm working very hard and like for me things worked out. But I didn't realize how privileged I was because of the color of my skin and because actually, you know, Romania is a poor country in Europe, but it's still rich compared to many other countries. So for me, like going to these places and realizing, you know, maybe the next Einstein, maybe the next inventor is here, but no matter how hard this kids work. For some of them, it's really, really hard to get access to certain opportunities. So it almost felt like this opportunity that we got comes with a responsibility of sharing back and learning together, but not in a preachy way, more in a, you know, uh, we're in, in this together way. Let's play together way. So this is like, the students, the mentors that participating, doing a big, big maker fair for all the other students in their university. And the best part is that some of them actually came back to Berlin and to Shenzhen, and we did these camps where they shared their learnings with people here. Um, so yeah, so the idea of, of them coming to Berlin was also we, 
wanted to design spaces in shipping containers because a lot of these workshops would happen in schools or universities, but if you don't have a space where you could do these workshops, you need to create a space. So we got this container for free in Berlin from the recycling company. And you can't really see it, but we put it right next to the Berlin Wall, which was awesome. And we transformed it into a maker lab, invention lab. And we had like mentors from Nigeria, from Zambia, from Slovakia, from Mexico, from Germany, from all over the world coming and running workshops uh, with local people. So it was really, really, really nice. Um, and from, you know, from shipping containers and from uh, tinkering with electronics that you find like in the back corner shop of your village, I wanted to go to the core of innovation and I wanted to go to MIT because I know that a lot of technologies that we're using and a lot of big ideas came from there. And I knew that I'm bringing a lot of this experience from the field, from having worked with so many young people around the world. So I really wanted to go like, and talk to the scientists, get their vision, but also contribute with my vision, uh, where we have to connect the design of these big technologies with the way people are actually understanding them and using them in their real lives. So I, I went to Media Lab, uh, and, you know, it's, it's a dream place um, because it's very interdisciplinary. There's more than 40 research groups, anything from, I don't know, uh, biomechatronics to uh, f there's a group that just started recently called Sculpting Evolution that is doing more like genetic research. So it's very diverse, very interdisciplinary. And I joined uh, initially this group, which is called Lifelong Kindergarten. Um, the name describes the group very well. Um, it was very playful. Uh, it's basically the group that started and created Scratch. How many of you have heard about Scratch? Okay, quite a few. So Scratch is a programming platform for kids. It's using these visual blocks I will show you in a second. And it's open source, it's online, it's free, and it's the largest community for kids to learn how to program online. It's translated in more than 50 languages, German included. And it started 10 years ago. They just had their 10 years anniversary. So I was working on this program extensions for toys and hardware. And basically, I was particularly interested into designing a platform that allows kids to train smart toys and smart devices. So why, was, why did I want to do that? It's because when I joined Media Lab, I realized that basically an entire generation is growing up with AI. So I know in Germany, although Alexa speaks German, and I'll show you some videos, it's like hilarious. Um, it's not yet in the homes, right? Like people here are a little bit more skeptical of these technologies. We don't know how they affect our kids, or we don't know if they record on us, they spy on us, so we won't put them in the house. How many Alexas do you think they're in homes in US? Every, not, not yet everyone. But do you, do you have an idea? Do you have a number? About 60%. Yes, very good. It's about 60%. It's almost like, it's like 50%. But yeah, it's a lot of the population and it's estimated to grow a lot. So it's like 47 million people have this in their homes. And this device was not designed for kids per se, but kids end up using it. So just imagine like, I grew up with internet, so my generation takes internet for granted. Like, I, if I'm not on in the internet, I feel like I'm missing an extension of my body. Like, that's how I grew up. But these kids are gonna grow up with AI. So for them, they take for granted that I speak to my robot and my robot comes to me and does something. Or they take for granted that you just ask questions via voice. Imagine four-year-old, can get on the internet via voice. You don't need to read or write to be able to ask any question you want and get an answer. So that's really going to change how people perceive technology, how people under, like, what their expectations of technologies are, how they develop, how they perceive even communication with their peers. Right? If you grow up with this, if you see people talking to devices all the time, like they talk to other people, it's really going to change how these kids are growing up. So 
I wanted to understand how exactly that will change kids' understanding, perception, behavior. And I started looking into research, and basically in 2016, when I started to look into this, there were very little studies. So to say there were no studies like looking at how kids interact with AI or perceive AI. So we did an initial study in Media Lab to see what children think about machines that think. And basically what we found is that, and we had very broad spectrum of ages from three year and a half years old to 12 years old. And we allowed them to play with many different devices like Alexa, dolls, robots. And then we asked them, after they play with these devices, we asked them, do you think it's smart? Do you think it's smarter than you? Alexa, what does dinosaurs eat? Dinosaurs are the best food. Dinosaurs are the And this was where it gets interesting. She's well, I okay. think she's smart. That's smart. That's smart. Finn said that she's not a... Is it your friend, right? So if he knows the name, he's friendly. We actually asked Google, and she said, yes, I am Google. <laughs> okay, <laughs> and this was in the break. He thought no one is going to hear that. Google Home was like, I know everything. You can mm -hmm. ask me anything. But Julie was like a normal person. She sounded like a Julie normal person. Julie was a chatbot. Hmm. And she, it felt like she actually understood what I was saying to her. Hey Google, who's your best friend? It's hard to pick, but if I had to, I'd pick you. Aww. Aww. So I don't know if you heard the last question from the child, but sometimes you would ask them, is, is this device your friend? And they would turn to the device and ask the question, who's your best friend? And the device would say, oh, I'm your best friend. And kids actually believe the device, of course, right? So as much as that is endearing, it's also you know, concerning. Like we, we see that there are boundaries in which you know, this young generation should befriend and trust and anthropomorphize these devices. And my approach to it was, you know, the fear-driven narrative is not enough. Yes, we need to understand how these technologies work, and we definitely need to understand what the boundaries are if we put them in our homes. But more so, I wanted to allow kids to program these devices and train these devices and actually create their AI technologies of the future that they think are good for them. And right now, we, like when I started this, that wasn't possible. So I start creating extensions to allow kids to take agency over these smart devices. And then this was the very first thing I built. It's an open source robot. You can 3D print it. And basically, kids could teach it by demonstration. So you would show it how to draw something. And then it would try to, to do the drawing as well. Yeah, sometimes it made mistakes, and that's endearing. Um, and then for the younger kids, they could also like program it with images. So like show it like a happy image, so he acts happy, or teach it to be, you know, like behave like a dog, or um, I don't know, throw balls, do all sorts of different things. Um, this is like a longer demo, so I'm gonna skip through it. But then we got into more interesting things like, oh, what if I teach it to play a game with me? How is it going to learn? The more we play, the better it becomes. How does it learn? Where does it know? What, where does it get the rules, right? So this was the first thing that I built with the kids. And then from this extension, we actually expanded to many more extensions. And the goal was to really democratize who creates with AI. The goal was to allow kids to define what AI for their generation is going to be like and not let big companies and corporations to decide that for them. Actually give them the tools to be able to, to show us how they want that future to look like. So I built this platform together with my team. It's open source. It's online. If we have time, I'm also going to do a live demo in a bit. It's called Cognimates, and it's building on top of Scratch and creating specific libraries so kids can learn about artificial intelligence by doing. And my vision is that this is not only for kids, but also for 
parents and that it's something that it can bring AI literacy in the home. Not everyone needs to be an engineer, not everyone needs to learn about technology, but it's almost understanding how these things work. It's almost like learning how to read and write. It is becoming a literacy because we all have, like Joran said earlier, these little computers in our pockets. And they have AI as well, it's just hidden. It's not a robot, but it's there. It sometimes records what we do, what we say. And for these kids, you know, these algorithms, these technologies will probably decide in what school they get into, if they're gonna get a loan or not from a bank. Like, really important decisions for their life. So, if they don't understand from an early age how that works and how, you know, everything you do, starting from your phone, to an Alexa that you have in the house, to you know the type of payment you're using when you buy a ticket for your tram, all of those things will affect your life in some shape or form. And I want kids to be aware of that, and I want families to understand that this is a new form of literacy that is very, very important. Um, so, yeah. Uh, of course, working with kids needs to be fun, otherwise they will get bored and run away. Uh, and basically, the, some of the first programs we did, this is an example of a girl designing a program to play hide and seek with a robot. So uh, these are the blocks I was telling you about. So basically, she's never programmed before. Um, she's a student in New York school. and. She met one of our robots, this robot is called Jibo. It was also developed at Media Lab, and she was like, I wanna play with the robot. And she saw this block which says, turn attention on or off. And turn attention on allows the robot to track like motion or sounds. So she had this idea, I'm gonna play hide and seek. And basically what the robot does is looking for sounds and motion. If it sees more than one person, he will say, I see you. So, the little girl started running around, and then the robot would look around, and then she would hide under the table, and then and he kept on saying, I see you, and then she would hide again. And I love this project because for me, this is creative learning, right? It's not just kids being in front of screens. It's like you have, you know, six blocks of code, but then you can play for half an hour, and it's fun, and you understand how it works. You know how the robot sees you, how it detects where you are, um, and then you can change the game. Maybe you want to play with your friends, so then you have number of people more than two, or maybe you can turn it in, into another game. But it's very, very generative. And the other cool thing about having embodied intelligent agents like robots is that when you program them, they can help you learn how to program them. So I'll show you a demo of how that looks like. Uh, I think it's here. Hi there, I would like to know your name. So let's do a program that allow me to learn it. Let's start with the green flag block. So he's helping me learn. There you go. You did it. No, I need you to help me ask a question. For that, we'll need the ask block. See if you can find it. Awesome. And so on, right? So imagine that you're talking to, you're programming something, and that thing, it helps you program itself. Uh, it's kind of interesting because, like, let's say you grow up in a place where there's nobody to teach you. How do you learn, right? And it's a new, unique opportunity to actually have these devices kind of explain themselves. And it's like, oh, you want to see how my camera works? Or you want to know how I can detect your voice? Or you want to know why I gave you that answer? So this is kind of like what the future of learning with AI could look like. And I want to show you a quick video to see how kids talk about Cognimates. One month, like, we went to so schools. So we were programming robots. We went to schools, and these kids actually got to do workshops for an entire month. And you'll see how they present what they did after one month. So let's hear it. So we were programming robots. You could play rock, paper, scissors. You did rock, paper, scissors into the camera, and on shoot you did one of the motions, and the camera did one of the motions, and it's like rock, paper, scissors, shoot. The computer gets like better as you play the game, because like us, we might not know everything at first, but if we keep trying, we get better. 
everyone has heard about like machine-based learning or artificial intelligence. And there was a sort of no questions asked for a lot of the more tech-savvy parents. It was like, go for it. Technology is gonna be a huge part of their lives, much more so than my life. If it's scary for some people, this AI technology, I totally get it. But as a parent and as a teacher, I thought it was really important because these are skills that 21st century kids need to have. When my dad was young, he bought a car and took it apart to see how it worked. So you teach people that young how these things that grown-ups mostly program, how it works. So I thought that was very telling, the seven-year-old boy telling us that AI is like the cars of their generation, right? In Germany, we have like a very long tradition of manufacturing and being at the forefront of manufacturing cars, for example. And then the question will be, how do we prepare kids to tinker and build the cars of their generation, right? And for me, it was mind-blowing that he actually made that analogy because he's seven and we only work with him for one month. Um, but yeah, that's, that's what you get when you get, give kids the opportunity to learn and express themselves in that way. So I will jump forward because we're running out of time. I had a lot of other things to show you, um, but basically, one thing that I wanted to share is that there's hope. Like the children that would say Alexa is smarter than me because it has so much information, they actually change their mind when we demystify this device, when we show that it's not magic intelligence, that it's people that have programmed that intelligent intelligence in the device. It's not artificial, actually, at all. We should change that term. We should say extended intelligence, not artificial intelligence, because people do it. It doesn't come out of ether. And the way kids change their mind is very interesting, because when we allow them to program Alexa, when we allow them to train their own smart models, We've seen after doing long-term studies, like six weeks, going to schools three times per week, public schools, private schools, community centers, private centers, kids from all social economical backgrounds, and kids that never programmed before, we saw that all of them would actually become more fluent in using this technology, but also more critical of this technology. So all of a sudden, it wasn't like, oh, this like, you know, super friendly magic robot knows my name. So, so smart. It was like, oh, someone taught it how to do that. I know how to make it better. And maybe I'll teach it to speak some German along the way, you know, like, so. We, we've also seen that it's actually different uh, in different cultures and different countries, which is why it's important to allow people of all sorts of geographies, all sorts of backgrounds, all sorts of, you know, um, interest to be part of this movement of des de designing the next tools for machine learning. And here you will see, like, we actually did workshops with Syrian kids as well in Berlin. Uh, there's this school for digital integration called Ready School, which is an amazing initiative. And what we found in our international schools is that the level of skepticism is very different from country to country. And you will be very happy to see that, you know, Germany, Berlin, were the most skeptical kids of how smart these devices are. Um, and they were also like some of the most skeptical in terms of like how truthful they are, right? Um, so, and, and to end, actually, this is a, these are pictures from a workshop we did with families in Berlin two weeks ago, so very recent. Uh, and I was told that a lot of people actually know who this person is. Um, so, Yange, uh, Range Yugeshva, uh, okay, I, it's hard to pronounce. Range Yugeshva uh, actually came to our workshops and um, the good news is that they filmed a documentary about what does it mean for children and families to have AI um, in Germany. It's going to be um, shown on ARD in April. It's called The Big Change. Um, Die große Umrau. Okay. 
uh, and yeah, he was great. He actually sat down with kids and talked to them like, why do you think it's smart? Why is it not smart? Uh, what do you want to teach it? How do you imagine we will use this in the future? And the best part also about this workshop, we actually had, you know, there's this big conversation about women in technology. I realized that we discriminated because when I invited all the organizers on stage, we were only women and basically, you know, the, the, from, from the director of Critical AI Lab, where I did a residency at Weissenbaum Institute, to head of robotics of Deutsche Telekom, head of AI at uh, T-Labs, student who is learning computer science right now, we were only women. And I was like, oh my god, we should invite some men on stage. I'm really, I feel bad. Like, um, yeah, I know. And basically, this like Cognimate started as my research project at MIT Media Lab, but it's now like an independent open source project. A lot of people have played with it around the world, and like we're gonna keep on translating it and improving it. Tomorrow I'm gonna teach teachers here how to use it. I can't wait. And uh, yeah, I'm hoping. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hoping that, you know, we will keep this like playful mindset, this kind of hacking mindset, reverse engineering things, and really inspire an entire generation of kids to, to build the future they deserve. Um, and the most important thing is also to inspire them to imagine, imagine things that we cannot imagine anymore. Um, because well, that's what kids have, and that's the magic of working with kids. And I think if they can imagine beautiful things, they will be able to create them. And I hope to be able to continue to support that with my work. I'm sorry if this was long, so, and I, I'm, you know, I hope I didn't talk too fast. But uh, yeah, thank you for coming, and let's imagine. Let's imagine a future that we can create together with our kids. Thank you very much. That was amazing, Thanks. and um, I was half joking before your talk that my job was the first one to be taken over by an algorithm, which now it has, because the questions from the room are much better than the questions that I have prepared. Um, so I just try to take one question from my 10 question list, and then we'll change to the questions above. So if you um, want to vote on questions, you still can. The address is up there, is it? Yes, it is. And um, we will bring up these questions in, I don't know, four or five minutes. Mm -hmm. One question I have, I read about your work, a lot about your work. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that it's um, very much about education and technology and learning and tinkering and fixing things. Mm -hmm. Also in your biography, it says there are many of these components, mm -hmm. but it's also about community. Yes. Can you say something about the role of community for learning, about education, uh, technology-driven or not technology-driven? Thank you for the question. Um, basically, I think community is the first piece before technology, before it's like the glue. Uh, the reason, for example, Scratch is the largest community, more than 10 million kids, is because of the community. Is because children want to share their games and see what other games kids do, other kids do, remix their projects, give feedback. So what brings kids in is the community. And same with my work, like wherever I went, you saw that example with AfriMakers. It was this community of students that wanted to help other students or wanted to, you know, have fun with their friends and tinker together. And we see it all the time. Like there is a big conversation now, for example, about online learning and doing these massive online courses. But people have a hard time engaging because we're social animals. Like we need to see the eyes of another person, see how other people enjoy the same thing, or talk to them when we get frustrated. So we we will always have that and always need that. And that's also like a message that I have for the teachers in the room or the teachers tomorrow. It's not like we will replace people with AI. We will always have people. It's just that sometimes the role of people will change. But yeah, I think community is key. Um, what's the role of school in this mm -hmm. whole field? 
Whew, that's a tricky one. Um, I think historically, um, I read a lot about this. My mom is a teacher, and uh, my first master's in Europe was actually about pedagogy and new learning models. And it's kind of interesting because school hasn't innovated since the Industrial Revolution. And the reason we have the school system we have today was because Industrial Revolution, because we needed to split people into age groups, create a generation of people that can obey to rules and conform very well. Before that, we actually had a different learning model where it would be groups of kids of different ages teaching to each other. The best way of learning is teaching, actually. Um, but then we had factories, so we needed a lot of workers. So we start actually copying this model from Prussian army of how do you train a lot of people and make them obey. And that became de facto curriculum and you know, system that we're still using today. It has changed so little. I mean, for me, I can tell you, I've been working with kids for eight years, more than that. The kids that I'm working with today, like I show them videos of a mouse solving a, a maze and they are like, thinking the mouse is a robot. Like four years old are more used to see robots than mice in US, right? Or they, like the generation I'm working with today has seen more in their first like four years of life that I probably saw in my entire life, right? So we really need to like shift the way we prepare this students. Um, and I think the role of school um, is important in the sense that, yes, young people adopt technologies very fast, but they don't have the wisdom to always make the right decision. So we will always need like teachers and parents to step in and be like, okay, you know, like, let's talk about bullying online or let's talk about difficult topics. Um, but I'm hoping, like my biggest hope is on one side to have the government support and institutional support to invest into teacher training um, and to support more project-based approaches. And on the other hand, to have the teachers as well that change a little bit their mindset and they don't want to always know everything. Like when I showed my platform to my mom, she was like, oh, first I need to learn it perfectly and then I'm gonna go and teach it to my students. And I'm like, no mom, <laughs> because we're gonna keep on changing the platform. Just go and play with them and you're gonna learn together. So I think school is, it still plays a really important role in society, but it needs to adapt faster. Um, and that's, it's, a, it's tricky. Let's go to our first question up there, and I just uh, fixed it so that it will stay on to top until you answer it. No, it will not. It's, te <laughs> it's technology. Oh, I just didn't fix it the right way. So the question is, how can we train the trainers or the teachers who are still mostly in a very analog world? Yeah, that's a, it's a very good question. So basically, I've done a lot of workshops with teachers, and the reason I work with physical things is because it's the best way to engage people both kids and teachers and adults. So a lot of the time when I work with teachers, I ask them, what do you do? What are t the type of games you do with your students? Or what, what are your current practices? Like, how do you teach what you teach? And then work from that and think, like, how can we integrate? Like, let's say you have a biology lesson and you talk about, you know, uh, climate or climate change. Maybe we can have an activity where we start recording data from some like small sensors. Oh, how is the how much wind do we have today or how much sun we have today? What about tomorrow? What about the day after tomorrow? How can we, you know, like teach kids to look at that data? Um, so usually it's like starting from their practices and like seeing what are the things they're already doing. Um, the other thing I would say is the most important for teachers, and that's why I already brought so many toys, is like when some of these devices like come to life, teachers become kids as well. Uh, and it's really awesome because like if you want them to learn about these things, they need to get ex excited first. So I allow them to play a lot and experiment and get excited um, because that's the first entry point. Uh, we have some more questions about schools, so let's... Uh cluster them. Okay. It's, first question, is, is school still the right institution for contemporary edu education? And um, the other question is, was it, it was something about the curriculum. 
Yeah. Do this question first, and I'll find the question on the curriculum. Is yeah. school still the right institution? For contemporary education. I think learning happens everywhere. So that's why I design for families and for learning at home and for learning at school. But actually, I've done a lot of workshops in museums, libraries. Um, for example, it's very interesting in US, the most trusted institution is the public library. It's more trusted than schools. And it's also an institution where people of all sorts of communities and social economical background come together. So it's one of the few places where you don't have segregation, where people can actually be exposed to diversity. Um, so in my opinion, I would rephrase the question because I wouldn't say there is one right institution I just think that we need overall to create a culture of learning. Like learning doesn't stop when you're on the train or driving home. You're, we're always learning and we're always like, we, we need to have this mindset of asking questions, critical thinking, not being afraid of what we don't know. And all of these things come naturally to kids because they always ask why, why? And they're not afraid to press a button and see what it does. So I think, the way I would approach this in the future is actually allowing more people of all backgrounds and ages and allowing more young people to have a voice and design their own tools and teach each other and not expect to have an institution or a figure of power that comes and like trains everyone else because that's not sustainable. Things are changing too fast. So we need to have collective intelligence. Like we're all, every single person would bring a different perspective, a different question, a different knowledge, wisdom. So I see it much more decentralized. And I think it is important to invest in schools and support schools, but it's not enough, definitely. There are three, three questions um, mm -hmm. as a follow up. Uh, what would you write into the curriculum for schools today for every girl and boy about technology? Mm -hmm. What are the skills we need to teach today? And when teaching coding to kids seemed like a crazy idea in 2012, what is it now? Okay, I'll start with the last one. So the crazy idea now is to actually teach machine learning to kids because by the time these children will be adults, what coding is is not going to be the same. Like, everyone will need to have some sort of knowledge about data science. We see all the big companies, they created their own curriculum for machine learning, and they are replacing their engineers, like, with more data, like, machine learning uh, scientists. So, I think from a job perspective, for people who think about, oh, education should prepare kids for job, uh, my response is, like, no, actually, we need to prepare kids to, that are creative thinkers, problem solvers, and a generation that can adapt and learn very fast. Because the change is the only constant for this generation. Things will always change. Um, so how can we prepare more children that ha are creative in ways in which machines cannot be creative and that um, can create projects and analogies that we cannot program into algorithms. That's, that's the big challenge. Um, and I think it's a crazy, it's not a crazy idea, but it's, um, it goes back to our example of the six-year-old soldering. Uh, we are afraid sometimes we protect our kids too much. And my approach is like, no, let's, let's, let's allow them to learn these things. Like we saw that they're able to do it and let's learn with them. Let's learn together. Um, yeah, in terms of curriculum, um, basically, I, I think this is an open question still. Like, we put on our website, like, a lot of examples of projects and learning guides. We're translating them to German. We're actively collaborating with teachers and also museum educators and also makers, practitioners to create more activities. I would call them projects, not curriculum, just project-based learning. Um, I think it's, it's still an open question because we still need to do a lot of research to understand what concepts can children understand and when and what's the best way to explain it. And machine learning is very new. So this is a, it's a long-term project. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have a definitive answer to that. What are the skills we need to teach today? Is I already answered it. Yeah, same, yeah. yeah. Um, 
some of them. Oh yeah, I should also say that we need full rounded people because one thing that I definitely learned at MIT is that sometimes people, smart people get so lost in the science world. Like we love our tools and you get to meet many other like very intelligent people and you go into the lab and you develop these robots or these experiments and you get more and more fascinated about your work. But we often need to take a step back and ask, why are we doing this? Why do we do research? Why do we do science? Like the ultimate goal is to benefit people, to benefit our lives, to have a positive impact. And I think that this mindset or this empathy towards others, like is what I'm doing helping others or not harming others, like this mindset and this Kindness needs to start very early. Like we need kindness and grounded life experiences for kids just as much as we need them to understand technology, probably more. Um, so especially in this day and age where we talk so much about ethics and bias and challenges of technology, it comes down to values. Like what are the values that we have and we pass on to the next generation? Yeah. Maybe one question, um, not from the uh, mm -hmm. Paul. Um, is it a very German thing? I, I learned you, you've lived in Berlin for three years. Yes. So you If got you some question. insights on, mm -hmm. things, uh, on the German mindset. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes in discussions we say, like, employability, learning for a job, something opposed to empowerment and to creating a better world. Yeah. Is it a very German view? Well, I'm going to say something very politically incorrect. I don't know if Berlin can be proper Germany. Um, <laughs> I mean, of course, uh -huh. it's like, but it's, it, it is, um, I love living in Berlin and I love going back. And um, my experience with the different mindsets, especially with the German mindset, was that you like rules. That's not a surprise. <laughs> um, Sometimes that is very helpful. Um, I think it's it's definitely um, how should I put this? Um, <laughs> should we put off the live stream for five minutes? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I think I really think that it's a challenge not only for Germany, definitely for Germany. We see that with these big industries, right? Like the big car manufacturers, they're all looking into new technologies, like you talk to Volkswagen, you talk to Mercedes, like all of these companies are investing into how do you talk to your car, how do you use the car for different things. They, they know they need to innovate or they're going to not be able to compete. Um, so people know they need to challenge the mindset, but it's hard. Um, and I think a lot of times, like for example, for parents, it's easier to change the mindset if they see their kid doing something that they did not expect or they didn't do when they grew up. Um, but yeah, we will talk later about the digitalization and yeah. like, yeah, some of the challenges that I, I see here. Okay, so let's go to the top of the question because there are two um, mm. very, very positive voted questions. First is, in your opinion, how problematic are the security flaws in smart devices when children work with them? And the second one is, do you see danger in understanding the depth of computers later on if children work with simple technologies like Scratch when they are young? Mm. Right. So the first question about security. Uh, a lot of these devices, uh, like my friend Kayla, one of the dolls that we had in the pictures, are not yet secure enough. So this is a field where a lot of research needs to be done. And um, basically it's problematic because that doll was hacked when it was released in Europe. So it's actually, you cannot buy it in Europe anymore. It's banned from the market here. But in US you can still order it online. Um, and with a lot of like the robots I'm using, like Vector Robot, for example, is encrypted. So all the voices that kids, like when the kids talk to the robot, that data is not being sent online all the computation happens on the robot and it's secured. And like the companies that are, some of the companies that are designing these devices really understand why it's important to have good security and good encryption. And the ones that don't, 
will face regulation and pressure to actually also improve their practices. So in that, in that view, actually one of the things where Germany is really good, I just went to the Chaos Communication Club, is caring about GDPR, caring about security, caring about privacy. But again, like it's, um, it's a balance, right? Like I think sometimes you do want to allow kids to use some of these devices, even if they're not fully secured, just so they understand what are the pros and cons. So, and at the same time, try to have as best of security practice as possible. Um, the, the biggest challenge is that a lot of the times the companies that design these devices might not have the expertise and the know-how in how best to secure them. And security in general, even if it's for our laptops or phones, it's always a race. Like people who are trying to hack them get better and then security gets better, but it's always a race. Um, in terms of the question about Scratch, that's a very interesting one. Um, I should say that Scratch is not simple at all. Like I can show you kids implementing object recognition algorithm in Scratch. And it might seem simple because you see the blocks, but actually it was designed in a way that it's not intimidating when you're starting to program with it, but it also allows for very complex projects. So the way uh, Mitch Resnick, who created um, Scratch, defines this is like low barrier of entry like and high ceiling, so allowing the you know, kids who really are very good at it to build like very complex things. So it's not, you know, it's not a dumb programming tool for kids at all. And adults use it as well. Um, now, of course, there's lots of research to look into how the knowledge that kids learn with Scratch or other visual programming languages like Cognimates or translates to when they start programming with Python or JavaScript. And that's still something that we need to like understand more. But I will just say, Scratch is being used at Harvard and MIT also for graduate students. Because when you want people to understand the concepts, like what's a loop? How does a function work? Um, you don't want them to get stuck because they missed the semicolon, right? You want them to be able to operate and build projects fast so they understand the concepts. Um, so yeah, I think it's a great entry point uh, and I think we also need many more tools. Um, it was designed mainly for coding, not necessarily for machine learning or data training. Um, so that's, we, we will need many more tools for, for enabling kids to do that. We also have some questions about coding, uh, which is 2019 a big thing in Germany. Mm -hmm. um, the first question is, should we lobby for coding to become a regular subject at public schools? The second question is, what's the difference for you between coding literacy and AI literacy? Are coding skills out and we need completely new skills in the age of AI? Um, and the third one, is, is it wonderful that there are many offers to kids when it comes to coding, but how about courses for adults? Don't we need to educate them more so they can create a better world, world for all of us? Yes. <laughs> Also, I should say that all of these questions are very big questions, and we're doing them in groups of three, which for my jet lag brain is like a big challenge. Oh, we can do one <laughs> of them. Yeah. The first one is, should we lobby for coding uh, okay. as a subject? Um, yeah, so I, um, I don't think we should lobby for coding to become a regular subject. Um, I think we should lobby for project-based learning to become part of schools. Um, I think, on one hand, when there was so much push for STEM education, humanities and arts and design and all these other disciplines were left behind. And that's a really big problem because I mentioned earlier we want creative people, we want full rounded people, we want people who can develop their values. You cannot do that if you're only focusing on the engineering part. Well, the reason why I like project-based learning is because it starts from kids' passion. Like, let's say I'm a child that really likes music, so I'm gonna make a musical room. In doing a musical room, I need to learn about electronics, design, music, you know, I express my identity. It's like, I start with something that I love, but in that process, I learn all the skills that I actually need to develop. Um, so I think we should advocate for more hands-on, project-based learning, 
um, and not have engineering mindset become a new religion. Um, because technology cannot fix everything. It's people, again, it's not artificial. Um, the difference between coding literacy and AI literacy, that's a very good question. Um, I actually see people understanding AI and machine learning. I would refer more to machine learning because that's a more correct <laughs> term. Um, being integrated as part of people learning about programming and learning about technology. What is very different, um, and this is something that you will see in that video with kids, they, they understood it, is that when you have machine learning, you're not just sending a set of instructions to a computer or a robot or a phone. You are constantly feeding data to it. So it's a feedback loop. That's the biggest paradigm shift for the AI literacy, is understanding that every single thing we do, like if we had a robot here now with us, it would learn from our conversation. So it wasn't just the initial instruction where I would say, you know, uh, yeah. say this when you hear this. It's like it would learn from all the words we're using, and that will react based on that, and we will react based on that too. So, like, like humans do, a girl said in the... Exactly, yeah. like the girl said, like the computer learns, yeah. like we learn. And that's where it becomes interesting, because it's a mutual adaptation. We adapt, like the way we talk adapts to what, for example, Alexa can understand, but the device also needs to adapt to us, like what we think it's normal for for a device to know or learn or... So right now with machine learning, the problem is that it's mostly people who adapt to the technology. It's not so much that the technology adapts to people in terms of design. And that's why I want with AI literacy for us to start to know what to ask and start to know this is really something that, you know, the technology should do. Yeah. So for, for the last 10 minutes uh, for questions on stage, I would like to invite you to take a look at those questions that are down there because all the new questions are not up there because you haven't voted for them. So now we have the old questions uh, on the top. So maybe, I don't know, there are many, many questions at the bottom. So if you want to take a look at your smartphone and um, vote for some questions. The so first one I will translate. Yeah. Uh, it's, who would be interested to try something like what you're talking about in Hamburg? And you cannot answer this question, but the community can. So I've, I think we, we just organize a, a meetup. Can people use this room after um, 9.30? Or is it closed? This one in here? Yes. I think we should go out. Yes, I just want to have another room for the people who have a meetup for trying this in Hamburg. Just, well, uh, so it's like at 9.40, people <laughs> interested in building a community for this in Hamburg. Just meet at this, is it a real plant? I, I don't know, at this tree. Is this, is it a real tree? <laughs> okay, so at this um, corner of the room. So 9.40 for everyone interested in trying this in Hamburg, building a community, this is your first meet up there. Maybe you can join them. Sure. Um, <laughs> but you cannot come to every meeting in Hamburg, if we're afraid, but. Oh, I can always come back, uh, but I would, <laughs> Don't yeah. promise too much. <laughs> um, um, okay. Cool. Uh, there's also the healthy skepticism one, which I really like. Uh, there was one that created like a, a laughing effect. I wanted uh, yeah. to see which one it, that was. There was the healthy skepticism, skepticism was, what about a healthy skepticism when it comes to new and unknown technologies, wouldn't that be a health, healthy for our future society? Uh, <laughs> What about a healthy skeptic that be healthy for future society? Yes. Um, <laughs> okay. uh, so, I mean, I definitely think we need a dose of playfulness and weirdness, but also healthy skepticism. Like you saw when I was showing, like uh, the. Um, comparison between kids in Berlin and kids in US and kids in like Sweden. Um, and you saw how all the kids are actually becoming more skeptical of these technologies if we break the magic, if we open like the black box and show them how they work and how they can program them. So... I think that's the general rule, isn't it? Yeah. The, the more people learn about it, not only kids. Yeah, the more people yeah. learn about something, the more skeptical they become or the yeah. more they know what questions to ask. Yeah. Um, so they have I, a better skepticism. A be more, yeah, more informed more, yeah. skepticism. 
That's a, actually that's a great informed skepticism. Yes. Okay. I will quote you invented this, this tonight in Hamburg. Great. <laughs> um, uh, who's Eric? <laughs> Back there, okay. Hi, Eric. <laughs> We don't know who your friend is, but he says hi. Okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> What's currently the greatest challenge in your work and your research? Uh, um, yes, so many. Uh, let me think. Sleep more? Um, no, that's not the greatest challenge, but it is... Um, I think the, the greatest challenge in my research right now is the fact that AI is overhyped. Everyone talks about it, everyone has an opinion about it, it's in all the media, but unfortunately we do not have enough informed, informed skepticism. Um, so what I see right now in the public opinion is that conversation about AI, it's black and white. It's really like, it's good for you or it's bad for you. And it's just like cars. It's a technology. Uh, we need to make it what we want it to be. And uh, that's why I want to design tools where children actually like see all the shades of gray. There was another question earlier that was asking, how do we talk about ethical challenges with kids in my work? So for example, in the game where they were teaching the computer how to play rock, paper, scissors, let's say all the pictures the child used was only with his hand and he has a different skin color and his friend wants to come and play with him and he doesn't recognize his friend's hand then the child very quickly understands like, oh my God, I need to take pictures of both of our hands so we can both play together with the computer. And then that's a very grounded way for children to understand bias and understand why it's important to have diverse data in order to have technology that works for everyone. Um, but it's not me lecturing them how AI should be or what AI should do, it's them realizing it for themselves by doing. So it's a much more grounded conversation about ethics and fairness and bias in AI uh, in our work. That, that's an interesting question uh, up here. Do kids teach the AI bad things? How do you bring ethical... Yeah, so this was the question I was referring really, to. Yeah. Now, that, let's, let's... It's also about bias. Maybe right. we haven't talked about... Um, the role of, of gender in yes. technology debates. Maybe you can add something about this. Um, yeah, I, I actually wanted to say, like, I like that bad here, it's in quotes, because one of the things that I love doing with kids when they train their models is for them to realize that what's bad for one person might be good for another person and the other way around. So the way we define bad or weird or funny or not funny It's, it, it can be also a personal thing. So that's why I think it's important to, to show them, you know, do you want to train a model just for yourself? Let's say we build a model for a chatbot and actually the kids wanted to do a chatbot that was a bad chatbot in the sense that it was um, doing backhanded compliments. It was like sassy. I don't know if that translates well to German, but it was basically, Backhanded compliments means when you say something nice, like, oh, your shoes look so good, but then you say, for being so cheap. So you say something nice, <laughs> but it's actually not nice at all. And they wanted to train a chatbot that could, could do those kind of compliments. And I thought that was like such a, a good idea because again it was all about the nuance it's like oh it's actually something nice but it's not really nice and these are the things that humans are very good at and then the question was like can we teach this to a machine right um but yeah in terms of like uh, what was your other the other question, question why, why don't we have we any questions about gender at least not at the top of the questions is it okay. not a question in germany um, about, oh yeah, this is like, we, we talked a little bit about this before, but um, yeah, you saw my picture about what does the future of AI look like, and we, all the organizers were women. I definitely want to believe that the future of this technology is much more diverse, um, and I'm part of that change. Um, one thing I can tell you is in the last workshop we had in Berlin, 
we had actually more girls participants than boys. And even the TV crew and everyone was very surprised because it was like so many robots. And it's like, how did you get all these girls to come and apply? And then my answer was, well, you cannot become something that you don't see. So if you see women that are like scientists and engineers and researchers and musicians, like if you see representation, you will believe, OK, I can do that because there's a precedent. Um, one thing that I can say is that um, I do, I am still surprised sometimes here when I give talks and people have a hard time believing that I build a platform. It's like, really? You, you program that? Can you? I'm like, who helped yes. You? Who helped yeah. you? Yeah, yeah. Or like, oh, let me show you how you can connect the project. I'm like, no, it's okay. I can. We all contain multitudes. And then, or the other expectation that if you're a woman scientist or a woman engineer, you should look in a certain way. Or, and I like to be extremely feminine. And also, you know, I climb, I code, I do. I can do so. Many, we can all do so many things. Like, why do we expect? to be able to only fit in one box, because that's, that's not really how it works. Um, so yeah, I would say it's going to change, I hope, and I'm pushing for that. Like, I'm not just hopeful, I'm actually acting on it. Yeah. Um, we only have some more minutes left. So yes. let's say we take three more questions from the list, and yeah. I would have another one, the fourth one. Okay. Uh, Number one is now a tech question. Uh, if you look at the AI spendings in the US, China, Europe, mm. how fit for the future, which is very German, um, mm -hmm. uh, it's very popular to say we have to be fit for the future in Germany. Mm -hmm. no? uh, are we in Europe, Germany? Are you still confident or high alert? That's a very good question. Whoever posed this question, thank you for doing it. Um, the reason I'm in Europe now, it's because I actually really wanted, like I came to do this residency in Berlin because I think it's very important for Europe not to be left behind, both in terms of high-end research, industrial applications, education, uh, ethics, regulation, policy. Um, I, I definitely think if we look at China and US, they are the major player right now in terms of AI development, AI research. And I, I have a lot of hope for European approach of designing more civic-minded technologies, but I definitely think that our governments, both at a European level and at the national level, should put their money where their you know, public speeches are. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> so the institute I'm working with in, in Berlin, it's called Weissenbaum Institute, and it was this institute for the internet, uh, for the future of internet, and the German government made a big statement investing uh, all this funding in creating this institute, and it's named after Joseph Weissenbaum, who created the first chatbot that became very popular, Eliza, in the 60s, but actually had a very healthy skepticism, criticism about technologies and how we should develop them. Um, so, you know, I love this place and that's why I came to do the residency there. I'm hoping to see many more initiatives like that. Um, I think um, we should be on high alert. I don't think in Europe we're doing enough. Uh, I definitely think um, I would love to see more efforts, more funding for research in this field, for attracting like a lot of the talent in America is from Europe. Like a lot of the people who are doing all these PhDs and postdocs and publishing in all the Ivy League schools are European people. Why are they going to US and not doing it in Europe? That's a big question, right? How do we retain talent? How do we make sure that those people come back? Like myself, like you've seen I've been working on this all my life and I'm clearly not doing it for money. <laughs> uh, I would not work in education if that was my motivation, right? But what can Europe and European Union offer me with this like very novel approach to be like, we need to teach machine learning to kids in schools in project-based ways. 
how can we do that? It's like, where, where do I get support? Because usually here in Europe, we are so risk adverse. We only want to invest in something if we know for sure it works. And if, we, if it's a proven model, if you come recommended, if you already have like a lot of you know, uh, validation, and that's not how innovation works. So, yeah, I, I definitely think we should be on high alert, and whatever it is that you can do, I definitely think change starts with people, with each and one of us. Whatever you can do, volunteer for an initiative, if you work in policy, change, the, like, <laughs> we, we, we can all start to act on this, but we should definitely be on high alert. Um, we got a uh, question, um, f no, <laughs> so we have a race to the top now, but the question here is, um, how could you prevent AI flooding forms like this with spam messages? It's probably not AI, but human intelligence who brought this message up to the top. I don't know. Um, yeah, I think, so th it is a good question though, like uh, Microsoft at some point uh, had uh, a Twitter chatbot and they put it on Twitter so it can learn from people tweeting, and then they had to shut it down two days after because it started like, insulting people and saying inappropriate things. Um, but like you mentioned, it was people who were tweeting at it and who were like, trying to see can it do that or not. Or... So I think AI is a reflection of us. It will show our biggest strengths, but also our vulnerabilities. Uh, I love the fact that when we need to train a machine learning model, for example, it almost like makes us pose like very deep questions. And it's the same with the kids. Let's imagine for a, se a, a second that we want to teach this computer to play music. We need to decide what do we consider music to be? What's noise and what's music? What examples of songs do we choose? Why? Who gets to choose them? How many, right? So it really makes us go back. It's like looking at us and everything we've done and make like a lot of profound decisions. Like what is music? What is, you know, like which part of math should we teach it? Or what should we automate? What should we not? Um, so spam is always going to be a problem no matter what we do from like search engines to you know but i i definitely think that it's like a more profound question and i see it for kids like a lot a lot of time people differentiate themselves from computers in research in studies they would say oh yes computers are smart but we have emotions we have feelings and now you see all these social robots that can simulate emotions and then kids ask themselves like how are we different Right? Like, when do we know that a, a feeling or emotion is simulated and when do we know it's not? Because we also simulate emotions, right? So it, it, it's almost like this technology is like a metaphysical uh, object because it really makes us go back and ask very profound questions. So it might be a good choice to, to go on and be a philosopher? <laughs> I think we need Something. many more philosophers in AI and in general in life. Um, it it's definitely comes down to deep, profound questions. Um, the because the technology is done by people for people. Yeah. So, The last question from this list, and then we'll shut this down. Okay. Uh, is, is it wonderful that there are so many offers for kids when it comes to coding? What about adults? Oh, and yes. I now found the end of the sentence. It's, don't we need to educate them, the adults, more so they can create a better future for their kids? Yes. So I think we're all kids. I'm still a child. Uh, I, you know, like whenever I tell like my students how old I am, they never believe me. And then because it's like I act like a child, and I think that playing and being playful and Tinkering is like riding a bicycle. We never forget it. We just need to remember it. Um, I definitely think our platform is meant for all ages. Like it's not just for kids. Parents use it. Teachers use the use it. And it's anyone who's not technical and wants to start playing and is like, oh, I can put 
pictures of my flowers and see if a model can, you know, detect when I have a new flower, that it's a flower, or like, I don't know, like whatever you want, or you want to make like a, a sarcastic uh, friend that like tells you like bad jokes every morning. I don't know, everyone wants different things. Um, I definitely think that this, these tools are for everybody, and what kids do is just that they inspire us to not forget to play. And sometimes like the best discoveries and inventions always came through accidents and through playing. So let's not put too much pressure on, on it and just like, yeah, tinker. One more question for, for going out to the world tonight mm -hmm. and tomorrow, everyone. So okay. um, when it's about making the future, we talk about bold approaches and the necessary change in the education system and everything. Do you have one small step that everyone can do, uh, start making the future tomorrow? Absolutely. Um, you can go home and go to Cockney Mates <laughs> and try one of the projects and play with it um, and send me feedback what you want to us to create next. Or you can also, if you are a developer or want to learn, you can create new. It's The code is open source, so anyone can add to it. We are right now translating it in German, so we're going to ask for people to help with the translation. Um, so that's like a very concrete thing, where it's like you can go home tonight and what you saw the kids do, you can do it yourself. It's online. It's cockneymates.me. Um, or if you just Google cockneymates, it's the first result. You can't miss it. Um, another thing that you can do, a big takeaway, Whenever you see an article or hear someone talk about AI and how it's going to take over jobs and how, you know, Alexa is bad for kids, all of this, like, kind of, it's like, a, a jerk, how do you call it? Like, it's finished. It's like the statements where it's like, this is the way it is. Try to challenge that opinion and, and, and take it back to us. It's like, what do we do about that? Because It's not enough to say, you know, technology is bad or AI is bad. It's not going away. So it's a very tricky problem. And we need all of us to start talking about it, learning more about it, um, and not just reject it, but try to learn a little bit more and figure out ways in which we could make it work and help us make, make our lives better. Um, so, yeah. Have a uh, informed and healthy dose of skepticism and play. Uh, don't forget to play and have fun. Because, yeah. Just <laughs> great. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks again. It was great talking to you, and um, it was great um, from, from everyone in the audience, because I think we really had great questions, and no bullshit questions visible on this screen. <laughs> and responsible for making it not visible on this screen was the audience. Uh, so it was just great uh, talking to you in this way. And um, don't be uh, sad if your question didn't come up. We had the opportunity to answer a lot more questions than we could do by yeah. talking to each other um, the, the traditional way. And we can now continue talking by um, the, I don't know, what's there? Some drinks are there. Yeah. Yes. yes, have a drink and more conversation. Thanks again. Thank Great you. evening. Thank you. Thank you.